So far you get an A plus. A uh, whole bunch of folks came and asked me questions uh, after the first lecture, so that's, that's great. So th thanks for that. Um, thanks for coming back. Um, so we ended um, the first hour. Uh, on a great note, we wrote down the, we, by we I mean the projected, wrote down the Schwarzschild metric. Um, someone asked the question about whether the time direction is time, d by dt direction is time-like. So yes, yeah, so if you know this, so we're outside the horizon, so the d by t, t direction is time-like. Um, in fact, um, the form I want to write for the sort of the spatial slice, the spatial metric, spatial short shield, um, uh, it's rotationally symmetric, so an easy exercise shows that it's also conformally flat. Okay, so. So in, in three dimensions, there's higher dimensions too, I'll write it down. The, um, the Schwarzschild metric can be written as a conformal factor, so a function, a positive function to the fourth power, times what's inside here is the flat metric, okay? And it's a simple little, uh, an interesting little ODE argument to solve. Um, if you change the radial coordinate by making R tilde a function of R, and you just plug that into, into the metric, then in order to be able to get a factor, u of r to the fourth, to pull out, you must solve this ODE. So um, again, I won't do that in front of you, but uh, you solve it by separating. You make a substitution. And it's 1 plus m over 2r squared is the, is the solution of the ODE, which means u of r to the fourth is 1 plus m over 2r to the fourth. Okay, so you can rewrite the Schwarzschild metric, the Schwarzschild spatial metric, um, in conformally flat coordinates. Okay, the spatial part is this conformal factor times the flat metric, and then if you if you substitute in the um, the, the time component has this function in front of it. Okay, and that, that metric is is a Re Ricci flat space time. Um, so. As I mentioned uh, earlier, in terms of the constraint equations, the initial data uh, satisfies scalar curvature zero. It's a time symmetric solution of the constraints. Um, and really what, what this boils down to, as we'll see, is that the conformal factor, a one plus m over two r, is a harmonic function on punctured Euclidean space. And that's, that, that corresponds under the conformal change of scalar curvature, as we'll see, that corresponds to the scalar curvature of the uh, uh, Ramanian short show metric being zero. Okay. Um, there's a higher dimensional short shield too. Um, actually, uh, all right, so I'll say something about the sign of the mass uh, in a minute. But it basically, if you look at uh, 1 over x is essentially the fundamental solution of the uh, for, for the Laplacian, uh, Laplace's equation in, in, in R3, if you do the same thing in Rn, fundamental solutions 1 over x to the n minus 2. And this metric is a higher dimensional analog of the Schwarzschild spatial metric. <coughs> Scalar curvature is 0, and it's rotationally symmetric. OK. And it's defined on, so uh, I'll go back a slide, excuse me. So. Um, in the original sort of uh, Schwarzschild um, coordinates, uh, when r equals 2m, there's an issue with the, with the coordinates. Um, it's a well-known um, issue. In, um, in these sort of conformally flat coordinates, this makes sense for m positive. This makes sense for all r non-zero. So it's on punctured uh, Euclidean space. And so, so the exercise I, I leave you with at the bottom of the screen is, um, if you look at this spatial um, metric, you can look at, inside the space, you can look at the rotationally symmetric spheres at different radius levels and compute their intrinsic area and compute the area profile. How does that change? And if the mass is positive, you find that the areas of the spheres, so large spheres are roughly Euclidean, and then as you move in, the areas shrink, and they get to a point where they reach a minimum area amongst all these spheres. And then as you go inward, as you shrink the radius, actually, the areas of the spheres, the intrinsic areas, grow again. 
Okay? So a pictorial representation of the Schwarzschild metric of positive mass um, looks something like this. Each of these circles is a sphere. This one is the, a minimal sphere. Okay, and this is the Schwarzschild spatial metric. And these two halves across this sphere, there's an inversion in the sphere, uh, they're actually isometric to each other. Okay? Now that geometry breaks down if the mass is, well, if the mass is zero, it's Euclidean space. If the mass is negative, you actually have a sort of a, a singularity that happens. You have a sort of a point singularity. The areas of the spheres um, come in until you hit a singular point, a, a zero area. And it doesn't smoothly extend past that. So this is for positive mass. Right. Does this mass coincide with anything like the hot mass or the APM mass? So yeah, so that, that M, so yeah, so, so you'll, we'll see that in some of the talk. The, um, you can compute the, the, you know, the, the Hawking mass of the spheres. Uh, M is the ADM mass in this, in this situation. It, 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 right, so it, yeah, it, it's exactly what it is. Uh, Sorry, and is this time slicing you drawn there? Yes, this is t, t equals zero. So this is just this is just the spatial piece, t equals zero, right? And we're looking at the the uh, spatial metric here, or in higher dimensions here. And so I've had to take those spheres. And remember, e each one of the circles is a sphere. So it's it's large. It comes in to the minimum one, and then as you move in forward, it, the spheres actually get larger in, in area. So I've taken those spheres and stacked them up along a different axis. So you, you can see them. Does it happen at a particular radius? This? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can compute exactly the radius where that happens. So if you're in 3D, or I guess maybe, is it? No, no, I think, right. If you're in three dimensions, that's m over 2. Yeah. And there's a similar formula for any dimension. Yeah, so you can figure out that minimum sphere exactly. But again, sort of when, when M is, you want to keep this in mind, when M is negative, um, sort of you have a singular point and the metric doesn't extend smoothly past that point. All right, All right. so um, before we, we start solving the constraints, um, uh, I'll remind you, we derive the constraints by saying um, we have a hypersurface Induced geometry, the ambient metric, the Einstein constraint equations come from the Einstein equation and Gauss and Kodatsky. Put them together, you have the Einstein constraint. So they're necessary equations to have a certain kind of slice in a certain kind of space time. Um, what we'll spend most of the time on, you know, this is, um, or half the time on, I'd say, in my lectures, is, well, if we solve the constraints, I want to solve these equations, they're necessary conditions, are they sufficient? So if I have solutions of the constraints, so if all I have is the spatial piece, is there a space time that fits this picture? Okay? And so um, in terms of the introductory nature of a summer school, it's, it's worth going over at least to sketch a connection that can make that more concrete before we start solving the constraints. That's what I want to do. Um, the way we'll do it is we'll follow um, the uh, classical work of uh, Ivan Choquet um, uh who showed, again, that these um, necessary conditions, the Einstein constraints, are also sufficient. So you want to start from a solution of the constraints, and we want to build a, a space-time, satisfying the Einstein constraints. Well, I'll do this um, for vacuum, and then for different matter models, you can analyze each model and decide if it, uh, if it fits, okay? So, um, it turns out that, and there's a lot of words up there, so it turns out, so we wanna write, we wanna write um, the uh, Einstein equation in terms of an initial value problem where G and K give us the initial data, okay? So, um, a couple of things. First is the Einstein equation, Ricci equals zero, um, isn't strictly hyperbolic. 
There's a degeneracy like comes up in Ricci flow as well. Um, and so it turns out that we have to sort of, one way to approach this is to write the Einstein equations in certain coordinate systems to make the system look, or be, hyperbolic. Uh, but then you've got special conditions, gauge conditions, on your coordinates. Okay? There's different ways to formulate that, and I'll just use the sort of the coordinate formulation as opposed to a harmonic map point of view um, or, or a vector field point of view. Um, so what we want is we're going to compute the Einstein equation in or the Einstein tensor in wave coordinates. Those are coordinates on your space time where the, the satisfy the, the wave equation. So box here is the wave operator for the metric G bar. It's, it's like the Laplace operator, but the metric is Lorentzian. So these gauge functions are, so no let them equal be zero, but the, the gauge functions are for any coordinates, any metric, the wave operator on the coordinates. Okay? And we want them to vanish. Um, I'll mention, just in passing, if you have a Lorentzian manifold, you can locally set up wave coordinates. Right? So just take any coordinate system you want and then use, uh, you know, give me a time equal zero or you know, a spatial slice. Uh, in coordinates, and then use your given coordinates as initial data, and then solve the wave equation with that initial data. You'll produce wave coordinates. Um, you solve the uh, wave equation, and because the original set of coordinates were nice coordinates, the solutions you get will also be uh, local coordinates. Um, when you do that, you already have the space time g bar, right? In terms of turning this uh, Einstein e constraint equations around, we're going to start with G and K. We're not going to have G bar. That, that's what we're solving for. So you've got to be a little bit uh, careful about the, uh, the, the gauge condition. You're solving for G bar. Okay. All right. So um, here's sort of a rough outline. Um, we first write the PDE system we're going to solve. It's called the reduced Einstein equations. You write down the uh, Ricci operator in wave coordinates. Okay, I'll, I'll sketch that out momentarily. Um, once you have the PDE system, um, we then have to specify initial data. Okay? So some of the data I'll pick for simplicity. Uh, someone asked me in between about lapse and shift, if you've heard of those terms. Um, <coughs> pick sort of simple lapse and shift. Um, uh, but anyway, so that's part of the data. Um, oh, yeah. So the curvature, remember, is second order. So the initial data is going to be the space-time metric and the first derivative of the space-time metric. The zero derivative is the time derivative at time equals zero. That's what you get to propose. That's your initial data. OK? So g and k will determine the spatial, so mu nu at least one, the spatial metric and the time derivative of the spatial metric at time equals zero. That'll come from g and k, solving the constraints. So we know they're important somehow. There's remaining data. There's, there's g mu 0, 0 time derivative. That's not accounted for here yet. So we still can specify that. And we will. So does that make sense? We have a second order PDE, initial data on the metric g bar. We're going to specify some of it. That's kind of free for simplicity's sake. Some of it will come from the constraints. And the remaining part of it we're going to choose in a smart way. All right, so there's some calculations here. Again, the slides will be posted. I want to point out, and wave my hands a bit, and point out the, the, the important part of the calculation. Um, again, I'm sort of pointing out that the formal nature of this is some interesting connections. To, to do all this correctly, you have to be able to solve nonlinear wave equations and uh, function spaces. Here, I'm just pointing out the connection between the constraints uh, and the initial value problem. OK? So uh, we have to do some computations, again, Let's get ready to sort of hand wave. Don't try to jot this all down. All right, so first of all, um, I said you want to have wave coordinates in the end. They have to be arranged. So you write down your wave, your sort of your gauge functions, which is the, the, the wave equation on your coordinates. You have to compute the second covariant derivative, the Hessian on the coordinates, and take a trace. They're coordinates, so the first partials vanish. I mean, so this, the second partial vanish. And so when you compute the covariant derivative, all you have are Christoffel symbol terms. Okay, so your wave functions are this combination of Christoffel symbol terms. Okay? 
Now, the equation we want to solve is the second order. And then we're going to throw away first order terms. We want to write the equation in a way that makes it look hyperbolic. So second order. First derivative terms, we're going to throw away and, and, and lower derivatives. So in the next couple of slides, I use a tilde between two quantities. The difference, right, the difference is a function of g and first derivative of g, like the first partial derivative. So the difference doesn't depend on the second derivative. So the second derivative terms we hold. All right. So for example, uh, this combination comes up in a minute, so I'm kind of pointing it out. But look at this combination of partial derivatives of the gauge functions with metric terms, right? And a minus sign from here. So that's equivalent to this term. Why? Because if I took a derivative of the g, right? The gamma involves first derivatives of g. That would totally be first derivative terms, and I'm throwing them away. But derivatives of gamma have some second derivatives of the metric. I'm keeping those. Okay? You can further expand the derivatives of the Christoffel symbols, and I'll write that up on the next slide. Okay? So this term I'll, I'll, I'll write up again, but that's the basic mechanism. The Ricci tensor is, if you remember, it's some. The, the, the curvature is some combination of covariant derivatives, second covariant derivatives. And so the Ricci tensor can be written in coordinates, derivative of gamma terms, and quadratic and gamma terms. And of course, these quadratic and gamma terms can be thrown away. They're first derivatives. OK? So here's what we do. We take the gauge terms. That's the term I had on, on the previous slide. OK? So. I go back one more, sorry. Take this term here up to the sign. And if you expand these gamma terms, the derivative, throw away first derivatives, you're going to get second derivatives of the metric. Some terms disappear. Okay? It's not hard, but it would take too long to write everything up. So you just write that down, cancel out the terms that go away, and you end up with these terms in orange. Okay? Now, the Ricci tensor is what we really care about. And up to lower order terms, that was a, a difference of derivatives of gamma. I only want to keep second derivative terms. Okay? <coughs> How many will there be? Well, each gamma will contribute three second derivative terms. And if you notice, um, the first one, IMJK and IMKJ with a minus sign, those cancel. So we're left with four second derivative terms. Okay? Three of them are exactly the ones coming from this gauge term. One of them, with mk derivative, tracing over the space-time mk metric, gives you really a, a wave operator. So that means if we take the Ricci tensor and add this gauge term to it, we'll get a nice wave operator plus lower order terms that are first order in G. OK? So if we take our Ricci tensor and add a term to it, we get a nice um, hyperbolic, uh, nonlinear, but hyperbolic system. So if we solve the Einstein equation on this reduced Ricci, right, it doesn't solve the Einstein equation we want unless those gauge terms are zero, so if the coordinates are harmonic. But to be harmonic, we need to know the metric. So we got to play a game to get it all to sort of square the circle. All right. OK, so, uh, so the, the, the reduced Einstein equation that has the form, well, this is the nice hyperbolic term we saw and some first order terms. And there's theory for that, classical theory of, uh, of, of, of Lorray, for example can solve systems like this. So we're going to give, we're going to have initial conditions for this system. Okay? So we'll take local coordinates on a piece of your initial manifold M. Okay? Uh, X0, again, is the, is, is the time direction. And we're going to produce some initial data. So the point is, the reduced Einstein equation, we're going to just solve by PDEs. And then somehow show that if we set it up right, uh, we actually solve the Einstein equation. Okay? So where's the initial data? So again, earlier I said, we'll at time equals 0, 
will give you g0, 0 is minus 1, and g0 mu is 0. So that means that the time direction we're taking to be uh, unit normal to the, to the hypersurface. OK? Um, so what about the spatial metric and the time derivative of the spatial pieces of the metric? So the induced first fundamental form is supposed to be g. So that's fixed. The time derivative of g actually with our given conditions turns out to be, in this situation, the second fundamental form. If you take the derivative of the metric g on the coordinates mu nu, you get by the product rule two terms. Since these are coordinates, the 0 and the mu commute. So you can change the order of covariant derivatives. But by our condition on g0, 0, d0 is a unit time-like vector. So all we're doing is computing the tangential derivative of the normal vector. That's the second fundamental form. We can flip a coin for the minus sign. Let's not worry about it. But that's correct in, in, in my definition. OK? So, so we've got a couple of things we chose for simplicity. Based on those, given, a given data determines the part of our Cauchy data. What we haven't determined is time derivatives of G0 components. So those are still free. And we haven't used the constraints yet. OK? So how do we solve? How do we square the circle here? So um, we're going to impose the gauge condition at time equals 0. That condition is the lambda, the gauge functions, are all 0 at time 0. OK? We're going to do that with our remaining Cauchy data. Now we've got all our Cauchy data. So we solve the reduced system. Solve using uh, hyperbolic equations. Um, so the, where do these constraints come in? The constraints imply that the initial time derivative of the gauge conditions is 0. So you've got, um, initially, you've got sort of harmonic coordinates, sort of the, the, the gauge conditions are 0 on the slice. And then the first time derivative of that is 0 as well by the constraints. That's where the constraints come in. So how do you get the gauge functions to be 0 in the whole space time you're, you, you've built? I mean, you've built something now. Once you've solved the reduced system, you've produced a space time metric g bar. The question is, does it satisfy the vacuum Einstein equation? OK? So what you do is you've got um, the Cauchy data. <coughs> That gives you lambda 0 at the initial time. The constraints give you the derivative, the time derivative of lambda 0 at the initial time. Where does the, the rest come from? Well, the gauge functions actually satisfy themselves wave equations. So once you know that, you've got the gauge function satisfying wave equation. And at the initial time, the Cauchy data vanishes. So that means those gauge functions must always be 0. And then the reduced Einstein equation and the Einstein equation are the same. OK? All right? So essentially, there's some more calculations to do that I'm not going to do, but I'll just show you the, the, the level what they are. So if you take your um, uh, gauge functions and just expand this out, the Christoffel symbols, at t equals 0, you already know some of your Cauchy data is already given to you. So plug in what you know and show that you can pick this time, these time derivatives to make the lambdas be 0. It's not hard. It's just an algebraic exercise. OK? Now, um, assuming you've solved the reduced Ricci equation, the, the reduced Einstein equation, um, you can compute the actual Einstein tensor that you want to vanish for solving the vacuum Einstein equation. You compute it, and it turns out it's a combination of derivatives of your gauge function. OK? So you just do the computation. It's not, not too hard. Now, the constraints tell you that. We did this earlier. They tell you certain components of the Einstein tensor vanish at 0. That's what the constraints say. Certain components vanish. Now, again, these components are related to certain derivatives of lambda. If you do a little algebraic exercise, you can show the first time derivatives of lambda are 0 by the constraints. Okay, 
So this gives you the vanishing of the first time of lambda. So where's the equation come from? Well, it turns out, regardless of whether the Einstein equation is solving it or not, the, the, the Einstein tensor is divergence-free. So if you now take the Einstein tensor, first order in lambda, and then take its divergence, that equals zero, period. And if you compute it, you get a you get wave equation system for the lambdas. So you have a hyperbolic system with vanishing Cauchy. Okay, so that's one way to, to show again that if you start with G and K solving the constraints, we use that, you can interpret G and K as initial data, and then you actually have not just this Ramanian surface with some tensors on it, you also have a space-time. In this case, we, we talked about vacuum. You have a vacuum space-time satisfying an Einstein equation, and this sits inside it with induced metric and second fundamental form. Okay? All right, so let's take a quick summary here before we start solving. Um, so producing solutions of the constraint equations then, in principle, gives us space times. So producing interesting, in some sense, solutions of the constraints might give us interesting space times. It's not easy to start with a given solution of the constraints with or without something interesting in it, and then you can say, well, we have a space time that we evolved from this initial data. Uh, it's not easy just to ferret out um, the global properties of the space-time you get. There is one. It's a very hard problem to figure out, in general, the, the, the properties of, of the evolution. Um, but OK. But in principle, we now know, you know something about why we want to solve the constraints, because that gives us, uh, the, in principle, the ability to build interesting space-time. Um, so again, uh, we ought to have lots of solutions of the constraints. Given any space-time, any space-like slice gives us solutions, and it's an underdetermined system. So um, you might ask questions like, can we generate solutions? You might get even greedier and say, can we effectively parameterize the space of solutions? So in other words, can you say, all right, um, tell me, uh, what are the free parameters in the uh, that can sort of specify solutions of the constraint equations. So obviously, you know, G and K aren't free. <laughs> These aren't your totally free parameters. They're constrained. They have to satisfy a constraint equation. Right? Um, you might say, well, what parts of the data are free? All right, so there's various kind of questions you can ask, and then you can ask more questions, too, once you get started. So let's start with my, what might seem a, a simple equation to begin with. Again, I said this earlier. Look at the time symmetric, so k equals 0. There's no k. k is 0. Vacuum constraint, lambda 0, that comes down to scalar curvature equals 0. And let's just solve it on Euclidean space. All right? So you can start with the, with the Euclidean metric. And OK, so that's one solution. And you now say, let's take the Euclidean metric and perturb it by adding a small tensor. OK? So um, you might start by saying, well, why don't we try to just add a small tensor of compact support? So take the Euclidean metric and just perturb it a little bit in a little neighborhood, and let's try to have that be our metric. Um, and it turns out you can't do that. I mean, you don't produce anything non-trivial that way. So, if you take the Euclidean metric on R, Rn, R3, R, it's Rn, add a small compactly supported tensor, so, so you have a Ramanian metric, if you ask that the scalar curvature be 0, um, you have a flat metric. It, you have something which is diffeomorphic to the Euclidean metric. Um, that's not obvious, and uh, it's, a, it's a case of the positive mass theorem. Okay, so. Um, Already, something sort of very deep and very interesting comes up in trying to do what seemed like a very simple, simplest perturbation you might try to do. Um, uh, I'll sort of mention, you know, sort of, you, know, you can take, so what do I mean by diffeomorphism? Right? You can take a diffeomorphism of Euclidean space, which is the identity outside a compact set, and pull back the Euclidean metric and produce something 
that's the Euclidean tensor plus a little bit, but that doesn't give you anything really new. Right? That's about all you can do if you're looking at metrics of this form with scalar curvature equals zero. So a um, couple comments before we actually do something to solve. Um, so again, we can't produce anything new this way. Um, however, I wrote up earlier, I think on the second slide, the linearized scalar curvature operator, which was, I wrote it up in general for you know, any kind of non-degenerate metric. You can write it down, the linearization of the scalar curvature operator in Euclidean space, there's no Ricci term because the Ricci term is zero. And you have these two terms here. As a really good exercise, this one you might write down. It'll be posted, too. As a good exercise over lunch, um, show by hand on R3 there are non-trivial tensors H compactly supported that solve this equation. OK? You can, in fact, you can arrange H to be symmetric, compactly supported, have zero trace, like against the Euclidean metric, zero trace and zero divergence. Okay, such tensors are TT. And so uh, certainly then L of H would be zero. And that tells you that although you can't solve this nonlinear equation, R equals zero, you can solve it, well, with compact support, you can solve it to first order. It's a very nice sort of exercise. You know, to, you know just try it, in, try it in, in, in R3. So the positive mass theorem is something, you know, a little more subtle. Okay. Um, all right, so if we can't solve directly for just adding a compact supported H to G to get scalar curvature of zero, the next thing you might do might be something else. Then the next thing you might do would be to use a conformal factor. So in, in general dimensions, uh, one nice way to write a conformal factor, it might seem odd, is to write it as U to the 4 over N minus 2. Okay? In, earlier I said a conformal factor is just some positive function times your metric. If you write it this way, then when you do the scalar curvature equation that's about to come out, um, there are no first derivative terms of the conformal factor, exactly for that power. Okay, if I used a different power, you'd have a slightly more complicated scalar curvature formula. Okay? So a formula you will see over and over again in a number of lectures is the following. If you have a metric G and you have a conformal factor with this power, the scalar curvature of the conformal metric is this. That's a good exercise over lunch. It's not as fun as the other one, I think. But anyway, um, it's a classic one. You, you got to know how to do it. Just compute, maybe in normal coordinates. In 3D, in case there's too many n's here, in 3D, there's a, the, the n's reduced to the factors of 8 and power the exponent u to the minus fifth. Inside here is a linear operator in u, Laplacian minus a function times u. Okay, that's called the conformal Laplacian. Okay? So for example, if the metric G to start was flat, uh, its scalar curvature is zero. So all that's left in here is the Laplacian. So scalar curvature zero is equivalent to Laplacian with zero. As I said earlier about the Schwarzschild metric, the conformal factor in the conformally flat form is harmonic. It had a one over X in it in 3D. All right? Um, actually, with the dominant energy condition in mind, non-negative scalar curvature, I'll point out, the scalar curvature is non-negative is equivalent to, again, against the Euclidean metric, Laplace U is less than zero, or less than or equal to zero. Okay. They're super harmonic functions. Now, of course, if you just take the Euclidean metric and a conformal factor U, and suppose you want to solve where U goes to one at infinity, with the following ideas, we'll hear more this week. Um, and like in the short show metric, as you go toward infinity, you're often studying, you know, if you're studying isolated systems, you might be studying geometries which, which approach sort of in space time Minkowski, but in space, you might look at geometries that approach the flat metric, for example. So if you try that here, if you make your conformal factor go to one at infinity, so your metric approach is flat, and you solve either of these kind of equations or inequalities, you only get u as one. Like you don't get anything new if you're solving globally. All right. 
So um, we want to solve sort of, again, we want to sort of say, let's take the Euclidean perturb it and then solve for you. See if we can do that. OK? So again, uh, it's an important formula. So here's the equation under conformal change. Again, the, the inside equation here, or the inside operator here is called the conformal Laplacian. So if you happen to be solving for scalar curvature equals 0, the nonlinear terms can be canceled out. And you're actually solving a linear equation. But of course, I also sort of want to emphasize, you want the solution to be positive, strictly, because it, it's a conformal factor. So you, that has to come into play as well. OK? All right, so in order to start solving this thing, you want to know, you know, sort of function theory for operators of this form. All right? And again, the, this one is linear. Um, all right, so here's one way to sort of set this up. So I call g sub h, this Euclidean metric plus h for h small, let's say. Solving the scalar curvature equals 0 for a conformal factor reduces to solving this linear equation. OK? We want u to be positive and go to 1 at infinity for an asymptotically flat solution. So what we'll do is we'll subtract off the 1 part, write u equals 1 plus v. OK? So um, we want v to go to 0 at infinity. <coughs> so if we substitute this into the PDE, you get a right-hand side from, from, from the 1 here, plus 1. So you have a linear equation, the same linear operator, and a right-hand side. Now, a couple comments. It must be on the next slide, too, but I'll make them here. So the metric is, is a Euclidean plus something small. That means the scalar curvature term is small. Right? So this right-hand side is small. Um, and this R of GH is small. You have to quantify small in the right kind of spaces, but let's, let, let, let's not do that. Say we did. Um, so, so our PDE is sort of, you know, so the operator is some perturbation of a good old Laplace operator, and the right-hand side is small. OK? So this operator agrees with the Euclidean operator outside a compact set. As I said, it's sort of a small perturbation of the Euclidean Laplacian. So what you do is, and I'm not going to set up the, it's not really polite to do that the first morning, sort of set up all the right function spaces to write down the, the analysis. But you can set up function spaces so that delta is an isomorphism. And you have to do that in such a way, what do we want? We want v to go to 0 at infinity. OK? We want v to go to 0 at infinity. All right? So we, have, we want to have function spaces that capture that. Well, what kernel do you have? So the Laplace operator is, is, is self-adjoint. Again, you use the right spaces. But for functions going to 0, self-adjoint, and what's the kernel? Well, if you have Laplace v is 0, and v goes to 0 at infinity, it's just 0. So if you're in the right spaces, it's trivial kernel. And it's, you know, if, you have, if, you, if you have a suitable setup um, uh, so that it's self-adjoint, you can also say that it, it, it has uh, no co-kernel. So it's, it's an isomorphism. Okay, so suppose you've set that up. Delta, uh, the uh, uh, Laplacian is an isomorphism. And then this conformal Laplacian is a perturbation, a small perturbation of an isomorphism amongst the right Bonnock spaces. So it must be an isomorphism. So that means you can solve this linear equation then. OK? You solve it, because it's now a, an isomorphism. But of course, moreover, the right-hand side being suitably small, now that implies, by using the inverse, that v, the solution, will, will be small. That's good, because Remember that the conformal factor u is 1 plus v. So v is small, so 1 plus v is positive, And then v goes to 0 at infinity, because that's the way we set up the spaces to solve. Okay. Okay. So the point is, you can do this. You can, for small tensors, um, uh, you can solve for a conformal factor, solve this equation that give us more solutions, let's say, of the um, 
time symmetric constraint, conformal to Euclidean plus any small h you want to add. Now, I'll point out that such metrics we've constructed are called harmonically flat. So the h that we had, say compactly supported. So outside a compact set, h is 0, and the metric is just, the starting metric is just Euclidean. So outside a compact set, the thing we've produced is a conformal factor times Euclidean. And the scalar curvature is 0. And we saw about two slides ago that that means the Laplacian of u, the Euclidean Laplacian of u, is 0. OK? The scalar curvature is 0, which means the Euclidean Laplacian is 0. And u goes to 1 at infinity. So, so outside a compact set, it's harmonic and goes to 1 at infinity. The classical expansion of harmonic functions can now be invoked. And so this is in n dimensions. Um, you can then take your harmonic function, and outside a compact set, it goes to 1 at infinity. It can be written exactly in this form as a converging series. Okay? Uh, you might know, I mean, if you don't know this, it's just a fact. Um, one way to prove it is um, you can invert, it's called a Kelvin transform, you can invert infinity conformally, a neighborhood of infinity to a neighborhood of the origin. Uh, and then look at the, that inversion preserves harmonic functions. Every harmonic function has an expansion near the origin, and then invert it back to infinity, and uh, u minus 1 would have that kind of expansion. In this equation, a is a constant scalar, and beta is a constant vector. Um, in the expansion, the derivative of, the, of u falls off one faster at every order. You take the derivative of 1 over r, it's order 1 over r squared, and so on. Okay? So that's great. If I let um, a be defined to be m over 2, right? So we saw earlier the short shield metric had the same form for a conformal factor, except in, in, in the form we did, beta was 0. There's nothing else after that. It was just the first two terms. And a was m over 2 for the short shield. So if we do that, our metric g that we produced is short shield plus lower order terms. OK? I'll interpret just briefly and then sort of move on. I'll interpret this vector here. This vector basically measures what we might call a center of mass of the, of the metric. And I'll just tell you the formula. If you define c, I think I got this right, with the right number here. If I define c to be this vector beta, so c is a vector, divided by a, the scalar, as long as it's not 0, over n minus 2. That defines a center of mass. If I compute my conformal factor in coordinates kind of recentered, I get short shield, what I'd have for the short shield metric, plus the next term is missing. And then I go to the next term, and it's order minus n. So it's one order better. So if you uh, center the coordinates basically around this vector rescaled, um, it be, the, the asymptotics drop off from short shield one degree faster. And that, that defines a center of mass. Should A be zero? A is uh, m over 2, I think, right? A is m over 2, yeah. 2m. Oh, no, no, but in, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, if I go back, everyone will get seasick, but this is in conformally flat coordinates. So it's not, it's not 2m over r, like in the, the standard Schwarzschild, it's the, it's the conformally flat form, so it becomes m over 2. Uh, good. Right, right, right. What? Right, um, so remember, if you, yeah, so it's. n minus 2 to the 4 over n minus 2 times the Euclidean metric, that's when you change the coordinates, it becomes that. Yeah. OK. So um, one final comment on, on this, and I'll tell you where we're going uh, next. Um, all right. So if we have a harmonically flat metric, so it's scalar curvature 0, and then uh, outside a compact set near infinity, um, you're conformally flat of zero scalar curvature with a harmonic 
um, conformal factor. Okay. And we have this expansion. We'll hear a lot more about the mass, but and you heard about it here. So um, that that factor in the expansion is, ends up being related to the ADM mass. Okay. Um, U is harmonic outside a compact set. If we generated it by a small compactly supported tensor, then the scalar curvature equation we solve globally is this one. Okay, that's the, that's the uh, vanishing of the um, conformal Laplacian on U. Okay, so what we're gonna do is basically take this equation and integrate it. Okay, now remember, R of G H, that's the scalar curvature of this metric, Euclidean metric plus a perturbation. Um, that scalar curvature, you know, unless this were trivial, wouldn't be zero, it wouldn't be positive. Okay, if it's a non-trivial deformation, and you, you, you can talk about what that means. Um, this function is not gonna have a controlled sign. Okay? But anyway, we're gonna take this equation and integrate and apply the divergence theorem. Okay? Um, I'll point out, if we go to a large enough radius outside the support of H, then the spheres, the region we're integrating over outside is Euclidean space. Okay? So we'll take the PDE and integrate. When R is large, right, we're just going to get this, the, the boundary component is just the usual radial derivative in Euclidean space with the Euclidean measure. Okay? Now go back a slide. U has an expansion out there near infinity. Okay? So we'll plug that in. The only term that matters is the term with the A in it. The derivative of one is zero, and the higher order terms are going to disappear in the limit. They're not, they're not, uh, so they're too small to survive this integration. Okay? So if you do this and integrate now, you just get omega n minus 1 is the area of the sphere, um, uh, the unit sphere in n dimensions, and we have this. So if we solve, then we end up with twice a, is m, is equal to this integral. And the fact, and actually it's a fact, that m is non-negative, a is non-negative here, is totally not trivial. It doesn't just fall out. There's no sign condition. It's that. It's true. But uh, the fact that it's non-negative is, is not in that integral. OK? All right, so um, that's a little bit of, you'll see more of that in the discussion of the positive mass theorem. So I use the remaining five minutes of the morning lecture to sort of introduce where we're going next. So. Um, what we've done so far is um, reminded you where the Einstein equation comes from, derived the Einstein constraint equations, showed that um, they can be determined, or so, sort of there, you can interpret the Einstein constraints as the conditions you need on initial data in order to have that uh, well posed sort of initial value problem for the Einstein equation. Okay. Um, so we want to solve the constraint equations. And we just spent a few slides there um, doing a, a, a sort of what should be an interesting kind of example of the simplest constraint, R0, on, on, on Rn, just by trying to modify the Euclidean metric. And a number of interesting things already come up in that equation. Okay. All right, so let's get uh, greedier and, and uh, ask some more questions. So, um, you know, again, you can get really greedy and talk about sort of the structure of the space of solutions of the constraints. Um, what kind of structure does, you know, take all the solutions on a given manifold, or all the solutions that are asymptotically flat, and say, does that object itself have any good structure to it? So those, those are hard questions, actually. Um, um, I'll point out, if you look at the um, asymptotically flat metrics of zero scalar curvature on R3, for example, which I said was uh, interesting, and we just talked about solving it. And you look at the moduli space of all such solutions, 
and want to ask questions about it. So it was only recently proven that such a moduli space is connected. Like the simplest, maybe the simplest topological question you have about the space is how many components does it have? Um, and that was proved by Marquez using Ricci flow with surgery. So it's, again, it's sort of a very beautiful and, and, and deep uh, result. Um, so um, a classical attempt to sort of parameterize the space of solutions to understand the whole moduli space is um, using the conformal method of uh, Lichnerowitz, uh, Shoki Praha, York, Morhu. Um, and I want to sort of introduce that, and we'll see the classical method, and we'll uh, use it to do some gluing problems as well. So I'll use the last few minutes to sort of introduce the, the method, and then we'll start with it tomorrow morning. OK? So uh, the method works in any dimension, although I'll focus on three spatial dimensions, so space time four, for, uh, for simplicity. Um, again, the constraint equations we said earlier in, in this dimension is four equations and essentially to 12 unknowns. G and K are symmetric tensors. Okay, so there's basically six unknowns in each. Um, one might try to isolate certain parts of the data as free, certain parts of the components as free, and then solve for the others. So, um, in other words, the system of PDE you get is, we says, underdetermined. There's fewer equations than unknowns. If you first choose part of the data and put that into the system, then there's fewer degrees of freedom left. So if you pick all of the degrees of freedom except for four, you'll then get four equations, four unknowns, and a determined elliptic system. And uh, you get some mileage out of it. It doesn't answer every question, as, as we'll describe in, in, in the coming lectures. OK. All right. So um, again, I, sort of, I won't ram this all down in the last couple of minutes, but I'll sort of tell you a little bit about the setup. So um, essentially, the data for the conformal method, it's called the conformal method. So, so one part of the data will be not the metric G. So, so what I'll we'll give you is, instead of giving you the whole metric G, that's the whole thing, I'll give you the conformal class of G. That'll be part of the free data. That leaves one function of freedom, the conformal factor. That's part of G. What about the other degrees of freedom in K? Well, to do that, we're going to look at the York decomposition of symmetric tensors. OK? We're going to write a tensor. <laughs> we're going to write a symmetric tensor as a sum of a few parts. OK? There's the pure trace part that you just take the trace and normalize in n dimensions times the metric. That's here. That's the trace part. So these two parts are trace free. OK? You can further decompose those two parts into a TT part. We saw that earlier. That's divergence free and trace free. And then whatever's left over, there's an ansatz for this part. And this brings in another sort of interesting differential operator related to the Lie derivative. Um, it's called the conformal killing operator. So the ansatz for this term in the decomposition of tensors is that that tensor is LW, which is the lead derivative of W. I've written the indices down. Right? But this part's supposed to be trace-free. You subtract the divergence term off, making this tensor trace-free. Okay? And this LW is the conformal killing operator. If LW is 0, W generates uh, conformal isometries. It's called a conformal killing vector. So, and I'll finish with this. So, in three spatial dimensions, four space-time dimensions, we need four, equation, four unknowns for four equations for a determined constraint equation system. One unknown will be the scalar conformal factor. Where are the other three unknowns? So, and where's the other free data? The free data will be the trace, the trace part, the TT part, and then the data we're going to solve for is the long this longitudinal part is this vector w. That's the unknown. That's three more components. So the constraint equations will be written as a system for a conformal factor and a vector field. 
And we'll start with that tomorrow morning. Thanks.